I've been kicking around this industry for about 30 years, investigating uh, accidents with aerial devices. And we find that in talking to the person involved in the accident, the first thing they tell us is, I did this without thinking or I just wasn't thinking when it happened. And that's usually the case. In the daily routine of our job, we get, we get into some bad work habits, and we forget the basics. We forget those things we should be doing to make our job safe, safer and more productive. Now, I'll put more emphasis on this. You guys are real important to American Cable. They've got a lot of money invested in you. And they spent a lot of money on these aerial devices. And the reason they did this is twofold, okay? Number one, it makes your job safer and easier. And number two, it makes you more productive in what you do. So you have an obligation there to take care of that unit as best you can and to operate it properly. And we're here to show you how to do that. But like I said before, most accidents, the guy said, I just wasn't thinking or I did it without thinking. So just to let you know that you're not in that ballpark all by yourself, I'll tell you a little story about a guy I went to school with. His name was Kevin Sullivan. All through grade school, high school, he had one priority in his mind, and that was become a Catholic priest. When he graduated from school, he went on to college and was ordained a Catholic priest. When he was ordained, his dad gave him a gold watch and chain. Well, I don't know if you guys are aware of it or not, but an individual is ordained a priest. They send him to the poorest parish they can find for training. Kevin, they sent down New York City into Harlem into a parish that hadn't taken any money in about eight years. Kevin had been there about six or eight months. One Sunday morning, he was up giving mass, trying to get away, figure a way for the people to really participate in the parish took out his watch and chain and started swinging it. And he noticed that the whole congregation was following this thing. He said, I got him hypnotized. Would everybody please put a dollar in the collection plate? Lo and behold, when the parish emptied, the collection plate was overflowing with dollar bills. Kevin stashed it away. Next Sunday, did the same thing, asked for five dollars, got the same results. But he had to send the money in, so he did. Monday morning, he got a call from the Monsignor, and Monsignor said, Father Sullivan, I don't know what you're doing, but you've taken in more money in the last two Sundays into this parish than it's been taken in in eight years. What's your secret? He said, well, Monsignor, it's not exactly right, but I found a way to hypnotize my congregation. They do whatever I tell them. Monsignor said, boy, that's not right. But they haven't participated in that parish for so long. Next Sunday, asked for 10 and call me. Well, Sunday came and went, no call. Monday, no call. Tuesday, Monsignor couldn't wait any longer. He called Kevin. He said, Father Sullivan, why didn't you call me? Kevin said, Monsignor, you're not going to believe this. But he says, I was up in front of my congregation, had him hypnotized, ready to ask for the $10. The chain on my watch broke. It hit the floor, broke into a million pieces, and without thinking, I said, oh, shit. He said, we don't have this place cleaned up yet. So see, it happens to everybody. <clears throat> so we're going to get into basic hydraulics, and like I said, fellas, you're going to find this film to be just a little bit boring at first, but I'll take the boredom out of you after the film is over, and we'll get serious about this thing. So let's go right ahead and watch this film. Also, far more safely, because among other things, it eliminates the back-breaking work that taxes the crew's physical strength and lowers its efficiency. Now, what is it that gives these fast-moving, hard-working rigs their strength, their speed, their mobility? The answer, hydraulic power. Hydraulic power turns fingertip pressure into tons of force. Hydraulic power can be controlled easily Precisely. Hydraulic power can easily bring men, materials, and tools to the point where work is to be done. Yes, hydraulic power is truly a friendly, helpful giant to the linemen using it. But to others, to those who must service the equipment but are not familiar with its operation, hydraulic power can be a complete mystery tied up in a Gordian knot and saturated with hydraulic oil. Actually, hydraulics is simple enough 
once you understand its basic principles. So let's see what hydraulics is all about. A hydraulic system is simply a means of generating power with a liquid and transmitting that liquid to the point where power is needed. Generating and transmitting power. Sounds like an electrical power system, doesn't it? Well, a hydraulic system does have many things in common with an electrical system. Here, let me tell you. First of all, and before anything can happen, there must be flow and pressure in a hydraulic system, just as there must be flow and pressure in an electrical system. Pumps are required to generate liquid flow and pressure in a hydraulic system, just as generators are required to create current flow and pressure in an electrical system. And both systems must have a complete circuit, of course. In a hydraulic system, flow and pressure are transmitted through hoses and tubing, just as electric flow and pressure are transmitted through conductors. Power flow in a hydraulic system is controlled and directed through valves, just as power flow in an electric system is controlled and directed by switches. You think the similarity ends here? Not on your life. There's more. Electrical and hydraulic systems both have protective devices. In a hydraulic system, check valves and relief valves protect the system against reversals of flow and excessive pressure, just as circuit breakers and fuses protect an electrical system. In a hydraulic system, oil flowing through the system provides the power to perform work, just as current flowing through an electrical system provides the power to perform work. In a hydraulic system, the rate of oil flow is measured in GPM, gallons per minute. In an electrical system, the rate of current flow is measured in amperes. And the pressure in a hydraulic system is measured in PSI, pounds per square inch. The pressure in an electrical system is measured in volts. And here's something else. Hydraulic power, like electric power, can be converted into rotary movement with motors. As a matter of fact, it's just as hard to tell a hydraulic motor from a hydraulic pump as it is to tell an electric motor from an electric generator. There's one more similarity. Hydraulic power can be converted into straight line motion with cylinders. And electric power can be converted into straight line motion with solenoids. However, there is one big difference between an electrical circuit and a hydraulic circuit. In an electrical circuit, the current is converted into something else, light, heat, motion. But in a hydraulic circuit, the oil is not converted into anything else. It just stays oil and is recirculated through the system over and over again. Now, why transmit power hydraulically? Why use a liquid? And specifically, why use a liquid like oil? Well, there are several reasons, and here they are. First, why transmit power hydraulically? Obviously, because hydraulic power systems offer many advantages over other power systems. For example, since our equipment is used on or near energized conductors, it would be unsafe to use electricity as a form of power because a phase-to-ground circuit might be created, and that could energize the equipment. A mechanical system with its complicated gear trains, chains, cams, levers, and who knows what else, would be completely impractical. But a hydraulic system uses relatively simple, compact components which can be located where it's most convenient and where the work is to be done. Power is transmitted wherever it's required through tubing and hoses. And a hydraulic system can develop and deliver 
tremendous power. Now, that's advantage number one, and it's a big advantage. Now, why use a liquid? Well, there are two excellent reasons for using a liquid. First, liquids, having no shape of their own, adapt themselves to the shape of whatever happens to contain them, and can, therefore, be pumped through hoses, tubes, valves, cylinders, motors, or anything that will contain them. Second, for all practical purposes, liquids are incompressible. For this reason, the liquid in a system acts like a solid. Power is transmitted instantly without lost motion. Now bear that in mind and listen carefully because what I'm going to tell you now is the basis for our present day science of hydraulics. Some 300 odd years ago, a French scientist by the name of Pascal discovered the fact that pressure exerted on a confined liquid acts equally in all directions, undiminished in all directions, and at right angles to all surfaces. Let me repeat that. Pressure exerted on a confined liquid acts equally in all directions undiminished in all directions and at right angles to all surfaces. So, if we apply a pressure to one end of a confined column of oil, pressure is immediately transmitted to the other end of the column and to every single square inch of surface in the column. Now, I said a minute ago that hydraulic pressure is measured in PSI, pounds per square inch. This means that every square inch of surface inside the system is under the same pressure. In the case of the heavy duty polecat, this is 2100 PSI. Now here's something for you to think about. The topping cylinder in a heavy duty polecat has a piston with a flat surface of about 20 square inches. And you have 2,100 pounds of pressure pushing up on each one of those 20 square inches. That, my friends, adds up to 42,000 pounds of force pushing against the piston. You actually multiplied the available force by 20. And if that isn't a big advantage, I don't know what is. Now for the third question. Why use a liquid such as oil? Why not just plain water? Well, you know as well as I do that water freezes solid at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Hydraulic oils can be made so they'll still flow at 40 degrees below zero. Another reason for not using water is that water is too thin. It doesn't have enough viscosity and will flow through extremely small clearances that are designed to be closed by a heavier liquid. In addition, oil lubricates the parts as it flows through the system. So it reduces friction, minimizes wear, and protects the metal components from rust. All right. Now that you know the advantages of hydraulics over electrical or mechanical means of transmitting power in truck-mounted equipment, let's look at an elementary hydraulic system. This is a simplified version of the boom elevating circuit used to raise the main boom of a Pittman polecat or the lower boom of a Pittman hot stick. It consists of a reservoir, a gear pump, a single spool control valve, a cylinder, and the lines necessary to connect the whole system together. Right now, the pump is shut down, the boom is in the stowed position, and there is neither flow nor pressure in the system. Oil that is not flowing or is not under pressure is indicated in blue, but oil under pressure will be shown in red. Okay, let's start with the pump. This is a positive displacement gear pump. Positive displacement 
means that the pump delivers a constant volume of oil regardless of the resistance offered by the system. And incidentally, this type of pump is most frequently used in digger derricks. Now, as the gears rotate, oil is trapped between the gear teeth and the gear housing and is carried around to the discharge side of the pump. This creates a low pressure in the intake line and atmospheric pressure forces oil from the reservoir into the pump. Then, as the gears mesh on the discharge side, the oil trapped between the gear teeth is forced out of the pump into the line leading to the control valve. But before we leave the subject of pumps, let me mention vein type pumps, which are used on certain Pittman aerial devices. In vein type pumps, the rotor has a number of slots in which movable vanes are installed. As the rotor revolves, the vanes are forced against an elliptical shaped ring by centrifugal force, aided by liquid pressure, which is trapped behind the vanes in the slots. There's an inlet and an outlet at the opposite sides of the pump so that the action of the pump is balanced. The veins scoop up liquid at each inlet port and deliver it at its corresponding discharge port. But let's get back to the system. When oil leaves the pump, it flows to the control valve. The control valve used in the pole cats and hot sticks is of the open center type. It's designed to permit oil to flow through it back to the reservoir under little or no pressure when it's in its neutral position. But now watch the direction of flow change as the control valve is moved to extend the rod in the cylinder and raise the boom. Let's take a closer look at the control valve. Here's the way the control valve looked in the neutral position. Oil flowed around the valve spool and through to the reservoir. There was practically no pressure at this time. But as the spool was moved, oil was diverted to the lower end of the cylinder instead of into the reservoir. Now, with the piston blocking the flow of oil, the pump immediately builds up pressure as it forces more oil into the system. The oil in the upper part of the cylinder is now forced out by the piston and flows through the upper line, through the control valve, and back to the reservoir under little or no pressure. Reversing the control valve reverses the flow of oil to and from the cylinder. Here's what happens. As the control valve is shifted, oil under pressure from the pump is directed to the upper part of the cylinder. This pressure forces the piston down, lowering the boom. The oil from the lower part of the cylinder flows through the open center of the control valve to the reservoir, again, under little or no pressure. So far, we've seen the basic components required to raise and lower a boom. These were a pump to supply flow and pressure for power, a control valve to direct the power to the cylinder, and the cylinder to convert the power into motion. For safety's sake, though, we have another type of component in the circuit. Remember? Protective devices, relief valves, and check valves. A relief valve protects the hydraulic system against excessive pressures that could build up to the danger point if the operator continued to hold the valve open after the boom had gone as far as it could go. The relief valve is usually an adjustable spring-loaded check ball. Many times it's built into the control valve. Here we show it separate for simplicity. As the piston reaches the end of its stroke in the cylinder, the pump continues to build up pressure because the control valve is still being held open. Now, when the pressure in the system overcomes the force of the spring, it forces the check ball off its seat 
and opens the relief port. Oil then bypasses the control valve and returns to the reservoir, relieving the pressure in the system and preventing damage to the hoses, valves, and seals. And that is the purpose of a relief valve. The other protective device in the system is a pilot-operated check valve, which is mounted directly on the lower end of the boom lift cylinder. It is designed to prevent the boom from drifting down. Here, again for clarity, we're showing the valve separate from the cylinder. During a boom lift cycle, oil from the control valve flows through the check valve to the lower part of the cylinder. By pushing this check ball off its seat and opening the passage to the cylinder. Now, here's how this pilot-operated check valve keeps the boom from drifting down. With a load on the boom and the control valve in neutral, the pump is not directing oil to the cylinder. But the oil in the lower part of the cylinder is under pressure because of the weight of the boom and the load resting on the piston. This check ball is closed by the pressure in the lower part of the cylinder. With this port closed, Oil from the lower part of the cylinder is prevented from flowing back to the control valve and reservoir. So, with the oil under the piston trapped by the check valve, the piston is supported by a column of oil. And remember that you cannot compress liquids, and the boom cannot move down. But how do you get the boom down when you want to? When the operator moves the control to lower the boom, pressure builds up in the upper part of the cylinder and through a small line in the pilot-operated check valve. The pressure forces this small piston against a ball-check valve and pushes it open. Now this permits the oil in the lower part of the cylinder to flow through the pilot-operated check valve, back through the control valve, to the reservoir. I hope there's no need for me to tell you that it's important that both the relief valves and the pilot-operated check valves be properly adjusted to assure safe and efficient operation of the equipment. Well, there you have it, basic hydraulics. There are other components, other types of pumps, motors, cylinders, and valves that we haven't mentioned here, but they all function on the same basic principle. Let's review some of them. Pumps generate and transmit power through a liquid. Cylinders and motors convert hydraulic power into useful motion. Relief and check valves protect the system from excessive pressures and reversals of flow to prevent uncontrolled movement of oil in the system. As you can see, hydraulics is basically simple once you understand the basic principles. Now we're going to get serious about this. Talk about safety devices. Relief valves and holding valves. Looking at the sophisticated equipment that you have on that back wall, there is no way on the face of this earth that I, as a layman, could take a wrench or two wrenches and go back there and figure that thing out and make it work. But would you believe that we have people in the field operating aerial devices that think that they can check, set some of these relief valves and pressure valves in the field by air with a set of channel locks and a screwdriver or a crescent wrench and a screwdriver? Can you believe that? They're out there. And what they're going to do is they're going to get themselves hurt and they're going to get themselves hurt bad. These valves, and we got valves on there like you wouldn't believe. You just seen two. We got power bond valves. We got diverter valves. We got relief valves. We got check valves. We got override valves. We got valves on those things you've never heard of or could believe. But they're there. But they're there for a purpose. And those valves are checked and set by us either at the factory or at our place where we put the units together. And we have special equipment. We have special gauges. We have flow gauges. We have pressure gauges. 
uh, we have diome diometers. We have the necessary equipment to set these things to make them safe for you to operate. But yet we have people out in the field whose unit's not working properly who try to set these. Don't do it, guys. Leave it alone. Once you operate these units and, and get familiar with them, you can get into them, and you can tell in the New York Minute whether the thing is operating properly or not. If it's not operating properly, get a hold of your supervisor, get a hold of somebody, get out of that unit, get it fixed. Like I say, American Cable bought these units for two purposes. One, to make your job more productive, and two, to make it easier and safer. And if you're out there working in a unit that's defective, you're defeating the purposes. You're not going to be productive, and you're sure as heck not going to be safe. So if they're not working, get the things fixed. Don't try to fix them in the field. Now, what I'm about to tell you about hydraulics, you take to the bank, okay? Number one, the importance of keeping hydraulic fluid clean. The hydraulic fluid in those units is the lifeblood of those units, and if, that, if that's not at the proper level or it's not clean, it's not going to function. Believe it or not, you've got the most sophisticated hydraulic system ever designed in your body. Your blood is your hydraulic fluid, your heart is your pump, and it keeps everything within your body going. But what happens when that blood becomes contaminated? You've heard of cholesterol. What happens? The pump gets plugged up and it's not working. So you have to go in, you get the zipper in the front and the bypasses to make it work. Same thing with a hydraulic system, gentlemen. I've been around these things for 30 years. I can take a grain of sand and shut down in 30 seconds the most sophisticated hydraulic equipment ever built. I can shut it down in 30 seconds with a grain of sand. We have to keep that hydraulic oil clean. Now, how much pressure was on that cylinder? How much? 40. You're close. 42,000 pounds of pressure on that cylinder. Now, if you don't think that's a lot of pressure, what I want you to do is take your hard hats home with you tonight. You're going to need them. Go to the kitchen sink and turn on both faucets and try to stop the flow of water. You're only looking at 40 pounds of pressure, okay? Try to stop it. You can't stop it. You're going to need the hard hat because the wife's just going to kick hell out of you for messing up her kitchen. But try it. You can't stop it. That's only 40 pounds of pressure. We had an engineer out on the West Coast testing a cylinder like this, four-inch cylinder. Developed a pinhole leak. Without thinking, he went like this. The oil stopped at his shoulder, and that's where they cut his arm off. Hydraulic oil under pressure is dangerous, and I'll flat out guarantee you, the units that you're operating are operating under 1,800 to 2,000 pounds of pressure, okay? But if it develops a high pressure leak in it, either at a fitting or at a cylinder, and you pass your hand across it, guys, I'm telling you, it'll cut it off like a saw. That stuff is dangerous. You're not working in tinker toys out there. You're working in a piece of equipment that if you're not familiar with it, you don't take care of it, it's going to hurt you. Now, just to show that I'm not blowing smoke all over you, I want to show you a film. If you're a little queasy, don't watch this film. But it's an actual accident with hydraulic oil under pressure. Let's show that film, Mark. Very graphic pictures will be shown during this short presentation. Viewer's discretion is advised. Escaping fluid under pressure can penetrate the skin, causing serious injury. This injury was sustained by a mechanic working on a hydraulic impact wrench operating at 1,800 to 2,200 PSI, the same pressures aerial devices are set for.
experience indicates many doctors are not aware of the best treatment for this type of injury. Any oil left under the skin may result in a very serious infection and the onset of gangrene. All doctors may not recognize this danger. Gentlemen, there's the picture, and here's the word. If you develop a high-pressure leak or any type of leak in that unit, you shut it down and you get it fixed. Don't mess with it, because it can hurt you. <coughs> this guy lost his arm. Why did he lose his arm? Medical science at this point in time, with all of our technology, cannot find a way to combat or dilute hydraulic oil within the system of the human body. So what happens? Infections gangrene. The only way they've got to fight it is to remove that part of the body that's infected. It was either lose his arm or his life. He had no choice. The alternatives weren't that great. We have to keep our mind on what we're doing and we have to know what we're working with. Hydraulic oil under pressure can hurt you. The, uh, I have to tell you another little story while I'm up here <clears throat> talking about doing things without thinking. Here about two years ago, I was putting on a me meeting similar to this in southern Missouri, and I had my wife with me. We put on a meeting, and they had a little hospitality room, had some drinks, some hors d'oeuvres, but I had to be back in Springfield the next morning for a meeting. Then the, this meeting ran a little bit late, and I had a couple drinks. And I put the wife in the car, and I'm coming up Interstate 44, and I'm kind of in a hurry. Comes the red lights behind me, and the Missouri State Trooper pulled me over. I said, you was kind of speeding. I said, yes, sir, I was. I'm in a hurry to get home. I got a meeting in the morning, and I'm a little bit tired, and I want to get home. He said, well, I got to give you a ticket for speeding. I said, well, fine. I was speeding. He said, also, I'm going to give you a ticket for not wearing your seatbelt. And I said, wait a minute. I had my seatbelt on. He said, that's not the way I see it. You don't have your seatbelt on. I said, hey, when you pulled up behind me, I took my seatbelt off. I thought I was going to have to get out of the car. He said, I'm sorry, but that's not the way I see it. You don't have your seatbelt on. I said, I had it on. Ask my wife. He looked over at my wife and he said, did he have his seatbelt on? She said, yes, sir, he did, but I don't argue with him when he's been drinking. <laughs> you can't imagine what happened next. Uh, the next film we're going to see is, is put on by Time Manufacturing Company out of Waco, Texas. It's uh, uh, put on around a Versa lift. You have a few Versa lifts in your fleet, but also you have some Dura lifts. Irregardless of what machine you are operating, what we're going to do in this film it, it, it's just conducive to the machine that you're using. These are the same procedure you should use no matter what type of unit you're flying. So let's go ahead and get into that film. <clears throat> This operator training and safety video is intended to be used along with the operator's manual and is not intended to reduce or diminish the importance of the manual. Your company's work practices are not presented here. Follow your company's guidelines and procedures as you use your aerial device. This operator, otherwise known as the pilot, spends a great deal of time pre-flighting his equipment, otherwise known as his aircraft. There is an obvious parallel to the importance of knowing your equipment's capabilities, limitations, and condition. 
you, the operator, are charged with this responsibility. We at Time Manufacturing trust you will seek the knowledge of the equipment and operate your equipment in a safe manner. After all, you too will be airborne. This program was prepared by Time Manufacturing as an operator training and safety video and is intended to familiarize you with the non-insulated telescopic first lift models TEL24, TEL28, and TEL29. In your operator's manual, you will find various sections devoted to all aspects of the operation of your verse lift. One section covers safety. We will address this section thoroughly later in this presentation. Another section shows line drawings and lists the general specifications of your unit. You should be familiar with these specifications in order to realize the intended capabilities and limitations of your unit. You should take time to read this section carefully. At this time, let's examine some of the many built-in safety features you have on the VersaLift. One such feature is the counterbalance holding valves found on both the lift cylinder and the telescopic cylinder. These valves prevent the booms from drifting or creeping, and if a hose should fail, they automatically lock the cylinder in place, preventing the boom from falling. Inside the pedestal, a system relief valve is installed to limit system hydraulic pressure to a safe working level. The crossover relief valve prevents rotation drift and prevents damage to the rotation system should the operator inadvertently rotate in a pole or other obstructions and continue holding the rotation control switch. On units equipped with gravity leveling system, a bucket dash pot and limit stops prevent excessive rate of swing and limit the extent of bucket travel. A bucket lockout pin allows the operator to positively lock the bucket in place when the desired work position is reached. This prevents bucket sway and affords an extremely stable platform from which to work. Full controls at the bucket are provided, including an engine start stop and the optional emergency power or emergency letdown. The bucket controls consist of three toggle switches located on the control panel at the upper end of the telescopic boom within easy reach of the operator. Should your unit have the hydraulically leveled in-mount bucket, your controls are inside the bucket. A stow-unstow switch is available to level your bucket while you are in the work position should it be necessary. The control switches are oriented so that movement of a switch results in a corresponding movement of the bucket. They are spring-loaded in the neutral or off position so that when the switch is released, it springs to the neutral position and movement stops. The movement of the boom may also be controlled at the pedestal controls. Use of these controls will be discussed later. Before we pre-flight the truck and unit, let's look at a few preventative maintenance steps which are essential to safe operation and longer service life of your verse lift. This may not be your responsibility, however, you as an operator should have a basic knowledge of preventative maintenance. In the pedestal, you may check the rotation gearbox oil level by removing the plug located in the side of the gearbox. Oil should be just visible at the plug hole. Should you experience power or pump failure and your boom is extended over the side, the hex extension on the gearbox input shaft may be rotated to manually align the booms with the cradle. Check the tension on the rotation chain. A 1 8 inch side play is considered normal. While there, you may lubricate the chain with 30 weight motor oil. Check your electric rotation limit switch striker. This system prevents over rotation of the unit. The striker hits the rotation cutoff switch seen on the right and will not allow the boom to over rotate that would cause damage to the hoses. Use caution. The rotation switch is electric and the boom can be over-rotated at the lower controls. Check the bolts for tightness and security 
at the rotation drive shaft coupling. After the first 30 days of operation, the hydraulic oil filter should be replaced. Then every six months thereafter, be sure to close the valve directly above the filter before removing the filter. Also be sure to open the valve before operating the lift. Now let's walk through a pre-flight inspection that should be performed each day prior to leaving for the job site. Your truck should be inspected thoroughly beginning with your lights. Check the operation of the strobe lights, beacons, or other warning light devices. Check operation of the blinkers, both front and rear. Check under the hood for proper engine oil level and other fluid levels as necessary. Check for frayed or otherwise damaged belts and general condition of the engine. Always check your tire pressure. Low tire pressure could cause unit stability problems. Also check under your truck for signs of oil leakage from the truck or the lift. Should your truck be equipped with a torsion bar, inspect it for any signs of damage, loose, or missing bolts. On your unit, visually check the retainer rings on the boom pins. Although it is highly unlikely these would come off, they are vital for safe operation of the unit. Check the condition of the bucket spine. Check the bottom and the top dash pot bolts for security. Make sure there's a snap ring retainer on the bucket shaft and that it is well seated and tight. Also check the security of the bolts of the bucket mounting bracket. Your bucket should be checked for cracks or damage, particularly around the lip or in the case of a walkthrough bucket, check around the radius of the walkway. Minor gel coat cracks are not evidence of structural problems and shouldn't be of concern. By getting into your bucket for inspection, any cracks will be easier to detect. On units having in-mount buckets, inspect the mounting pin, the hydraulic leveling cylinder pins, both top and bottom, check bucket bearing housing bolts and D-ring, and make sure the hydraulic lines and control cards are not damaged. Check the condition of the boom strap. The tie-down strap was designed to prevent excessive movement of the boom while driving, thus preventing premature maintenance problems. Continue up the boom toward the mast, inspecting for signs of damage to the main boom or covers. At the turret, assure the safety wires are intact on the rotation drive shaft bolts. Inspect the mast wings for damage. Check the wells for signs of cracks and assure the retaining rings are in place and secure. At this time, check your hydraulic oil. The oil should be right to the bottom of the screen. 
If oil is needed, fill with both booms in the stowed position using the hydraulic oil type call for in your manual or that which your company calls for. Inspect the four mounting bolts at the base of the pedestal. There should be no signs of looseness, such as evidence of the lift moving on the bed of the truck. A minimum of three threads should be visible. If your VersaLift is a G model, that is an engine generator driven unit, check the oil and general condition of the generator. Also check the condition of the auxiliary battery. It's always a good idea to operate your unit from the bottom controls prior to going to the work site. Of course, untie the boom, and in the case of an in-mount bucket, unstow the bucket prior to operation of the controls. The bottom controls operate by pushing the desired control as indicated by the data plate placard. Use caution when rotating from the bottom controls. The rotation limit switch is electric and does not function when using the lower controls. Over rotation will cause damage to the hydraulic hoses and other component parts. While in this area, check the caution and danger decals in place and legible. Now with the majority of the pre-flight accomplished, let's talk safety. The emergency procedures are in your manual, so please read them and be prepared. In the event the unit is damaged while a man is in the air, or an emergency arises after he has gone aloft, immediately rotate the bucket away from any dangerous obstruction into a clear line of ascent when the booms are lowered. The machine should be operated through the shortest cycle possible to get the bucket on the ground, then operated from the pedestal control to finish storing the boom. Should a man be disabled or unconscious in the bucket, turn the bucket override switch to bucket override. Using the controls at the pedestal, rotate the boom clear of obstructions, retract upper boom, and lower to the ground. If the engine will not start but will crank, the booms may be stowed by activating the appropriate control toggle switch while cranking the engine with the engine start button. Crank intermittently at intervals of 30 seconds to conserve the battery. Should any control movement not stop when the switch is released, immediately push the engine stop switch. Hold the opposite control before attempting to restart the engine to see if the control is cleared. If power failure should occur and your unit is so equipped, the booms may be lowered by activating the emergency hydraulic or emergency lowering system. As mentioned before, the hex extension on the gearbox input shaft may be rotated to manually align the booms with the cradle. If your hydraulically level bucket starts to stow or a malfunction occurs in the bucket leveling system, on the P, B, or G models, activate the engine stop button to kill the engine and stop the pump. From the pedestal controls, activating the bucket override to override should shut the pump down, and turning off the truck engine with the key switch will also shut the pump down. With our pre-flight complete and upon arrival at the job site, set your brakes as equipped. If your unit is engine-driven B model, assure the transmission is in neutral position. Turn on the lights or beacons as required and engage your hydraulic power source. Depending on your company policies, set cones or signs and shock the wheels of your truck. Always use your safety belt and lanyard. Assure it is attached securely to the D-ring provided. 
on the job, your Versalift will allow you to be more productive as well as safe when used properly. Without getting into your company's work practices regarding signs, cone placement, etc., we will run through these illustrations of some do's and don'ts of safety. The Versa lifts you are operating are not insulated, and I'm sure your company work rules spell out your approaches to energized lines. Remember, there is no insulation afforded you from the fiberglass bucket, so don't count on it. The main thing is to watch for is inadvertent movement of the boom into a hot line or the possibility of a loose or drooping line. The bucket is your work platform. Don't climb out of it onto a pole or tree. The natural swing flex of the truck could cause the suddenly empty bucket to move out of your reach. Always stow your booms before driving your truck. Your reverse lift is a man lift with a rated bucket capacity of 300 pounds. It was not designed, built, or sold to be used as a crane, a line lift, or a cable puller. Remember, safe operation means not straining or breaking your equipment. Perhaps you need about two more feet to reach your workstation. Rather than adding something like this, it's better and safer to stow the lift and reposition the truck. Use your hand lines. Avoid dropping tools. Always use your safety belt. Avoid parking your truck on more than five degree slopes. How important is it? You're the man in the bucket. How important is it? I've been operating these things a long time, gentlemen. I can tell you flat out that I have yet to get in a bucket and operate a unit without operating it from the lower controls first. The reason being is I've seen too many things out there. You may be using the truck today, take it into the shop and park it, and overnight I have seen birds build nests in these units in less than three hours. These bird nests can cause a failure. And if you have a failure, you're going to get hurt. So operate it from the lower controls. Make sure that everything is functioning properly before you get in a doggone thing and go up in the air. Because once you're 29, 30 feet in the air, you're, you're, you're no longer effective. You know, you're at the mercy of that unit. And you want to make sure it's working properly. Guys, what we're going to do right now is I'm going to give you about a, a seven to eight minute break. Please watch the clock and come back in so I can get you out of here on time. So let's get up and stretch our legs and we'll have that little break and then we'll come back and finish the meeting up. What we're going to see now is a slide presentation. This slide presentation is based on accidents that have actually happened in aerial devices and have been reported to the National Safety Council. A few of these accidents I was personally involved in investigating the cause. When some of those pop up on the screen, I'll get into a little more detail on them. Uh, but again, uh, just stop me at any time if you have a question, and we'll get right on with the slide presentation. Watch equipment position on slopes. Uh, gentlemen, most manufacturing companies advocate that if you're going to operate those units on anything more than a five degree slope, you do one of two things. You either back it in or you pull it in. You work over the back of the unit or you work over the front of the unit. I might tell you, by the way, that this was a fatal accident. This gentleman did not survive this accident. Uh, he made two mistakes. He pulled on the job site, was working on a slope that was in the excess of five degrees. The second mistake he made was he didn't use these outrigger pads. Is everybody familiar with outrigger pads? Do you know what they are? He didn't use these outrigger pads. The ground gave away. The unit did not tip over, but it threw him into an energized conductor, and it did kill him. So if you come into a situation, hey, you guys aren't kidding me, I've been out there. 
when you're sent out to do a job, you have a responsibility to do that job. And I know you're going to try to do the job, okay? Just remember the limitations of your unit and do that job safely. This guy did not remember that. Here's another instance. Uh, in this instance, the unit did tip over. It was not a fatal injury, although the guy was injured. It wasn't fatal. But he did destroy the truck, and that's, that's an expensive accident when you tear a truck up, truck up like that. Uh, right now, you're looking at a truck uh, in your uh, category probably of about uh, 42 dollars to $47,000 what those units cost. So they're not cheap. They're rather expensive. This again, this guy got on a, uh, a slope. This slope was not in the excess of 5 degrees. In fact, it was just about a little over 4 degrees. But again, he forgot his outrigger pads and the ground wouldn't support it, it let the unit tip over and destroyed it. <clears throat> Keep tires properly inflated and the units that you are using, those units are stabilized with what we call a torsion bar suspension. And that is a torsion bar underneath the truck to keep it stable. But in using those type of uh, installations on a unit, the tires become about 27% of the stability of that unit. And if they don't have the proper inflation in, the, in, the, in there, the proper air in the tires, you're not as stable as you would be should you uh, keep the tires at the proper pressure. So in your walk-arounds, be sure to check your tires. It's very important to the stability of that unit. Very important. Look in direction of travel. By the way, this was a fatal accident. We come to find out in our investigation, the gentleman was watching a lady in a bikini in the backyard and not watching where he was going. And it killed him. Most aerial devices are designed that you can operate to control with your right hand and look in the direction that you are going to the work site. What's behind you is unimportant at this point in time. You're up near going to the work site. Always look in the direction of the travel of the boom. Keep yourself safe. Don't let yourself get in these situations. Don't attempt to transfer from the bucket while aloft. You guys may not believe this. This guy went to work. He was five foot eight. When he went home, he was six foot four. He was in that position for 35 minutes before somebody called 911. They got the fire engine out there to get him down. Any time that you approach your job site from a bucket and you can't reach that job site from the bucket, don't try this. This is asinine, really. What you do is you get down out of the bucket and relocate the truck and then get back up and do it. It's going to be more productive and it's going to be a lot safer. Once the weight, your body weight, leaves that bucket, that boom has a memory and that thing goes back to where it originally started from, like a rubber band. You stretch a rubber band, when you turn it loose, it goes right back to its normal. That's what these booms do. With your weight, they flex. When your weight leaves it, they go back. They have a memory. And they will remember, and they'll leave you hanging somewhere. And that's what happened to this guy. Check your safety stops. About the only thing this guy remembered was that Indian's name. Forgot his belt and lanyard. You know what? It killed him. He fell out of the bucket and it killed him. Because he wasn't thinking. He forgot to put his belt and lanyard on. Every aerial device that's built comes with a belt and lanyard. And only that comes with a place to hook it. You can hook your lanyard either on the bucket or on the boom. Now there's advantages and disadvantages to everything. But the only advantage that I see in hooking your lanyard to the bucket is, should the damn thing fall off, you're going to be easy to find because you're going to be in a four foot radius of it. Don't hook your lanyard to a bucket. Hook it to the boom. Hook it to something that's going to support your weight should you have an accident, the bucket fall off, or you fall out of the bucket. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you, being the man in the bucket, if you're ever in a situation like this, I want to tell you what, that'll pucker you up so tight if you pass gas, you're going to blow your head right off your shoulder. You got no place to go. You're in that bucket. You're at the mercy of that unit. 
I want to tell you, this was not a fatal accident, but it was an accident. The man was hurt. Happened up in northern Illinois. Got a call at about 11.30, went out on the job site, in a hurry, didn't want to leave television, set his micro brake lock. Does everybody know what a micro brake lock is? Set his micro brake lock. Got in the bucket and went up in the air. The micro brake lock failed. And when it failed, the truck rolled down the hill with him in it. Put him in the hospital, was off work for two years, and he's still, his back is still not right. In fact, I, I seen him less than three weeks ago, and his back is still not right. A micro brake lock is a backup system to your emergency brake and wheel chocks. A backup system. We have so much confidence in a micro brake system at our facility that when we install one, we put a warning signal on it. We hook it up to the horn. And should the brake bleed off, the horn starts honking to let the operator know, hey, you got a brake problem. Get down out of that unit and reset your brake. Don't put 100% faith in a micro brake system. It's a small hydraulic system, quarter inch tubing about the size of my finger. They connect to the brakes and they can fail. Don't do it. This guy swears up and down at that unit came up in the air while he was driving down the road investigating we found well that's not true unless he had Casper as a co-pilot that just don't happen what happened was his daughter was in a recital or something at the school and he was in a hurry and not thinking he just didn't stow his unit he got in the truck drove off hit the overpass and tore it off it's under exaggerated because he took everything from behind the cab and just set it in the street tore up a $45,000 unit because he wasn't thinking he had the worst case of neck lash you ever seen in your life, guys. Because he wasn't thinking. This is probably the biggest bugaboo of mine there is. Tie down straps. Simple procedure. You just tie the boom down. But yet you can go to any fleet, anywhere, and you can see the little black specks all over the boom where people don't tie their boom down and the strap comes up and chips the paint off the boom. You've seen them. Gentlemen, that is the worst damage that you can inflict on a unit. I don't care what you do. That constant vibration driving down the road, it has a tendency to loosen, loosen bushings, has a tendency to loosen pins, it has a tendency to loose fittings, you're going to get leaks. And hey, what did I tell you at the first? You're the person in the bucket, not me, you are. Why not take care of the thing? It's going to be safer to operate out of, and it's going to add a lot of longevity to the life of the unit. Tie it down. It's a simple process. Tie it down. Just keep safe. Keep clear of truck on, on hotline contact. Gentlemen, this was a fatal accident in northern Illinois. Office manager went out to talk to an employee about his insurance. The office manager of life just had a new baby boy. Had four children. Went out on the job site to talk to the crew member unbeknownst to him or anybody else that truck the operator of the truck had energized the unit he just walked up and casually leaned against the truck and that's the last thing he did in his whole life left a wife and four kids killed him right on the spot got to think you got to work safe <clears throat> especially you guys you guys, you, you know you work in the dark a lot, believe it or not. Everything you work on is below that. Who's telling you that down the line there isn't a loose wire laying across your cable? You don't know that. You guys' job is dangerous, and I'm here to tell you it is. Work safe. Keep your mind on what you're doing. <clears throat> don't overload the boom. This, guys, was a fatal accident. There are two types of aerial devices. We manufacture what we call a material handler. This unit is designed with a winch and jib out on the end of the boom to pick up stuff. It's designed, it's heavy duty. The units you're operating are man lifts and man lifts only. They have a bucket and boom capacity of 300 pounds, guys. That's all it's designed to pick up. 
And when you go out and start doing things like this, you're asking for trouble. And this guy asked for a lot of trouble. It killed him. They're just not designed to do that. They're designed to put you safely in the air so you can be productive doing your job. And that's all they're designed for. If you start lifting stuff with it, you're asking for trouble. Another thing happened on this one. This guy was up trimming a tree. He was afraid the tree was going to fall on something below him, so he tied the limb off to his boom. When he saw the limb off and the limb hit the end of that uh, line he had it tied to, it took him, boom, and everything else right to the ground. It wasn't a fatal accident, but he was lucky. It could have killed him. It's not designed to do that. Operate control smoothly. Avoid sudden stops. Similar to the vibration by not using your tie downs, these surges are rough on these units. The reason why it is is because in a rotation motion or movement on these units, the only support you've got is a rotation gearbox and a motor. And that's all you've got. On your up and downs, you've got that big topping cylinder there to help you give you support. But in a rotation mode, you don't have. You don't have anything holding you. And when you start rotating and turn loose of that control and that thing goes like this, Guys, it's bad. It's bad on the unit, and it's bad for your safe operating procedures. I'm not going to say something's going to happen at that point in time. It may not happen the next day. But if you continue that type of operation of those units, I'll guarantee you a failure. And when I guarantee you a failure, I'm telling you, you could get hurt. Operate it smoothly. Most of them have got two-speed throttles on it. If you get in a tight situation, you can slow the unit down and feather it in. But operate them smoothly. Proper maintenance prevents boom creep. This, this guy, it wasn't a fatal accident. He wasn't real, real popular. I told the other class, you know, you think Bill Clinton was unpopular. This guy was really unpopular. He did this on the outskirts of a town of about 5,500 people. He was sawing off a limb the movement of the boom and so on and so forth, he did not realize it was creeping down, creeped down into the conductors and tore them down and had a town of 5,500 out of electricity for five hours. And I want to tell you, when you walk over and hit the light switch and nothing happens, there's a bunch of unhappy people. They was ready to tar and feather him. And he could have prevented it. If he'd have did his morning walk around and checked his oil, he'd have found it was low on oil, the cylinders weren't being charged up and they were creeping down. But he didn't do it. Here we are again, uncontrolled swings. This was not a fatal. The gentleman did fracture his shoulder and had a skull fracture. We don't really know what happened. It was just a matter he wasn't thinking and or wasn't looking. Opened his control valve full up and swung right into the cross arm. <coughs> don't drill holes in the bottom of the bucket. And you're saying, how in the hell do I get the water out of it? If you do not have a mechanical dump or a hydraulic dump on your unit, then we recommend you take a coffee can or something, bail the water out, get some rags and sop it out. Don't do this. First thing you've done, you, you've endangered the integrity of that bucket right where you're standing. And that's the last place you want a failure on that bucket where you're standing. Second thing is there is some insulating factors in that bucket, and if you get it into an energized conductor, it's going to come right through that hole and get you. Don't drill holes in the bottom of the bucket. There again, this was not a fatal accident, but that guy had to grow up all over. It sure jarred him. It shrunk him a little bit when he hit the ground. Had a total boom failure. Reason why? Didn't check his oil levels didn't have enough lifeblood in that unit to make it operate and failed. He didn't make that mistake again. Keep a clean house. That really don't sound, it sounds, yeah, kind of picky rooney, but guys, it isn't really. If you're called out at night on a job and you have to use somebody else's truck and you crawl up in the back to get something out of it and you get your feet all tangled up in wire and cable and fall out and, 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 and bust your head open, you're going to be unhappy with somebody. And it really doesn't take that long to keep a clean house. It really don't. Keep it neat and orderly and it'll make you more productive and a hell of a lot safer. Check the oil in the engine daily. 
it's a known fact. When we mount an aerial device on the back of a truck, if the front end ain't working, that truck, that aerial device ain't going nowhere. So if that truck's not running properly, you're not going to get to your job site. So it's just important that you check the front of this as it is you check the back. Check your fluid levels. Make sure it's got oil in it. Make sure your coolant's in there. Make sure there's transmission grease or whatever. Check it out and make sure it is running properly. It'll make your life a lot simpler. Now I want to talk to you not me people in this room. And you're there. My name's Ryan. I don't have to wear my safety glasses. I'm not going to get something in my eye. Now, my name's David. I don't wear seat belts. I'm not going to have an accident. You're there. I'll tell you a little story about a not me person, okay? Was on a line crew. Went out on the job side one morning, and where they went was to a coal mine that they'd shut down. They went out there to tear the installation down. They was feeding this coal mine with 4,000 into a 55-foot pole with three transformers on it. They went out to take this installation down. They got out on the job site. A journeyman lineman went up the pole and started the procedure. Came lunchtime. He came down, had his bologna sandwich, and became ill. Looked at a second-year apprentice, and he said, would you go up and finish the job? The second-year apprentice being an aggressive type guy and a not-me individual, of course. Asked him, yes. He says, I'd love to do that job. Is it clear? The journeyman lineman said, it's clear. Second year apprentice went up the 55 foot pole, stood on top of the three transformers, reached around the back side of the pole to get his scare strap on, got into a 4,000 lead that the lineman had left on the back side of the pole. Knocked him to his knees on top of the transformers. In a semi unconscious state, he got up and tried to hook his scare strap in again. This time he got into the 4,000 lead again, and this time it took him off the pole onto a lumber pile got eight number 10 spikes in his back, a quarter inch on either side of his spine. The spring of the lumber pile threw him on his face and he got an eight number 10 spike in his lung. Blew both heels off. Blew every tooth in his head out. Had to surgically remove his wristwatch because it welded it to his arm. Now you guys are saying dumb journeyman lineman. You're wrong. Dumb second year apprentice. You know why? He depended on somebody else to make his job safe. And you cannot do that, gentlemen. You can't do it. Safety takes a group effort. But you have to act as an individual. And once you act as an individual and you keep your environment safe and your work site safe, you've made it safe for everybody around you. You have to think for yourself. Now, the story I'm telling you is true because you're looking at that dumb second-year apprentice. Can't shut that left hand. Can't walk six blocks. But most important, I can't do what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do line work, and I can't do it because there is no need for a one-handed lineman. You have three big responsibilities. First responsibility we talked about. And that responsibility is to American Cable because they're providing you a living. The second responsibility you have is to your family because if something happens to you, your family's going to suffer. And the third responsibility you have is to yourself as an individual. Don't neglect those responsibilities. Think safety. There's two ways you can look at safety, okay? You can be involved in safety, or you can be committed to safety. Now, I want to tell you how I do it. And believe me, I'm committed to safety. If I wasn't committed to safety, I would not have driven 350 miles to be here to put these on for you. I wouldn't get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to be here on time to put these up on for you. I'm committed to safety. I want you to work safe. Should I come back here, I want to see the same faces. So I'll tell you how I do it. When you get up in the morning and your wife or girlfriend throws your ham and eggs down in front of you, take a look at it. And remember, the chicken's involved, okay? But that damn pig is committed. And that's the way you make your safety program work. You commit yourself to safety. 
and it will work for you and it'll work for everybody around you guys that's our program we have a little test that we want you to take if you want to rip somebody's lips off see Alan or Gina so we'll pass each